Hi, hello everyone. Good afternoon. So on behalf of MySQL team, I welcome all of you to MySQL user camp event. So we almost started this event uh, somewhere in, uh, like uh, we also started organizing this event uh, last year in March and we have completed four events and this is the fifth event we are having. So the objective of the event uh, is it's like uh, basically the, the MySQL team get an opportunity to connect to more MySQL users and also the users who are interested to know about what is happening in MySQL, what are the new developments and also we get a chance to share with you people about new developments happening in MySQL and also the challenges or any issues you are facing with MySQL. So it is also like an opportunity for MySQL users to meet uh, the MySQL developers here. So uh, what we do here is uh, like uh, we basically start with a few presentations about some new developments happening in MySQL. So most of the topics we select here for presentations is based upon the inputs or wording or suggestions that comes from the MySQL users in the event. Or sometimes we get the suggestions in, uh, in our user camp uh, group that is in Facebook. So sometimes we, we have a few presentations which we are interested to share with the MySQL users. So we start with the presentations followed up by uh, Q&A sessions and also we, uh, we would like to have the introduction from everyone so that we can know each other who are assembled here from where you have come from or uh, what is your work or how, how you are feeling with MySQL view, words about which you want to express about MySQL. So after once we complete the presentation, we have the open talk session like where you can, uh, it's a open talk like you can uh, meet uh, every MySQL engineer here and uh, you can discuss anything, whatever you are interested. If you are facing any issues or if you have any suggestions from you or if you have anything uh, good or bad you want to discuss, so it is an open, open session and we can have that uh, once we complete all the presentations. So once again, welcome all of you to the user camp event. Uh, today the presentation what we have is our new features in MySQL 5.7 and also NoSQL support in MySQL. Then uh, the next presentation will be on MySQL fabric. So with this uh, I will hand over to Sugit to present on new features in MySQL 5.7. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to the first presentation. So in this presentation, I will uh, broadly describe what all new features we have in 5.7. Not all features, but mostly the few important features what we are going to provide in 5.7 till now. And then uh, I will cover the NoSQL support of MySQL. Means, uh, what is the NoSQL and how MySQL supporting the NoSQL and what is the improvement one can uh, expect using NoSQL. So this is the disclaimer. Say proper statement. I think you have already read. So, so today's program agenda. Whatever I already told you. Uh, what is MySQL? Then we will go through few MySQL features of 5.7. Then we will explain what is a NoSQL and then the NoSQL support in MySQL. So MySQL is the world's most widely used open source relational database management system that's run by the server, providing multi-user access to a number of databases. This is basically a, a definition means in a snapshot how what is the MySQL is. We have the important feature of MySQL. Uh, basically MySQL is a ACID compliant. We support fully uh, ACID. Uh, properties and MySQL comes with uh, two main uh, variables. One is the open source, we provide GPL version 2 licensing for that and another is the advanced or commercial licensing. So in commercial licensing we don't, uh, we have many packages, not only MySQL server, uh, other utilities, other components, we are not going to cover all those things but it's not only the MySQL server. Okay, MySQL is used by some of the largest web properties uh, in the world like uh, Facebook, Amazon, Google, Wins. there are many. We simply jump to the new MySQL uh, features in 5.7. So 
every time uh, my school going for a new uh, releases like from 5.1, 5.5, 5.6, 5.7. What we will do? We basically raise the bar. Means starting from the scalability. Means every in every aspect we basically improve everything. So we basically raise our bar. Uh, till now, MySQL 5.6 is the best release in whatever in market in a GA. But what comes in 5.7? So that we will go. We will explore here. So these are the few major things what MySQL 5.7 is going to provide till now. Means uh, 5.7.4 improved InnoDB, improved replication. Utilities have a rich set of uh, different tools. Then performance schema. Performance schema was there in 5.6 also, but some extra, something extra. We providing some extra instrumentation in performance schema. We are going to explain all those things. Then optimizer can uh, reduce the cost of query by uh, better optimizing the explain and other thing and high connection rate basically connect rate disconnect rate is higher like uh, in 5.5 the connection rate simple connect rate disconnect rate was something around 15 to 17k then 5.6 was it's 27k around these are all approximate data now what we come in 5.7 574 is almost 56k per second connected and disconnect. So we will start with the InnoDB improvement. In 5.6 we come with an online alter. So there are many queries which can be uh, means uh, we can go for online thing. Means earlier in 5.5 we don't have that feature we was uh, all copy and then change and then apply. Like we can't run concurrent queries while we are doing this online thing. But in 5.6 we provided some set of online alter. Now in 5.7 till now whatever we release we provide two new things. One is a rename index means one can uh, apply the, one can rename the index online and one is a online change the bracket size. So while we changing a bracket size earlier in a, it was we can't uh, do it on online basis means we have to stop all the queries whatever running apply the change and then start the query so that's basically a availability issues now user can go change the query uh, change the field size bracket size whatever he wants but simultaneously he can run or execute queries but there is a limit means uh, size changing the size there is a limit 0 to 256 255 this is the limit basically if someone is changing a size between 0 to 255 then he can apply a in place means an online thing but if he wants more than 255 like 256 and higher then we can use this online thing because 0 to 256 is a one bit byte length say so if I changing the size then we don't have to change the memory allocation differently because it's a one bit line. So that we can change in online. But if we are applying more than 255, means 256 or higher, that comes to length of two, two or more. So that we can do online. Okay, parallel database passing. So uh, as now uh, my school server is running a higher core positions. So there are uh, different uh, means how we flush the memory. In 5.6, that's a single thread. So uh, one thread is flushing all the memories. So let's say we have a eight core box, then only one thread is handling all, all the flushing. But now in 5.7, we have a multiple thread to flush the phases. So that's the limit is zero to, uh, means one to 64. So you have to scale up, means how you want to scale it you can scale it, means limit is 1 to 64. So that basically improved the performance. So uh, performance result shows it's improved almost, uh, hello. So it's improved uh, 10x performance here in this uh, data classification. And we tested it on a 8 core box. Yeah, we tested on a 8 core box and uh, Oracle Linux. 
So it's uh, in fiber seven. It support partitions for transportable table space. Like uh, let's say uh, if we want to take a backup of a server, either we have to copy all the files. Means there is no such thing that if uh, we can take a partial backup depending on a particular partition, not only table, depending on a particular partition. But 5.7 provides that feature that we can we can transport a table space depending on the partition. So earlier it was all table space is defined under the system table space. Now with this workload, with these changes, that system table space will be a subclass of a main table space. So basically a hierarchy is table place, table space, then system table space and individual table space. So if someone wants to back up a particular table or a particular partition of a table, he can import that, apply that and uh, means export, then apply and import. So that becomes very easy to take a partial backup. So, uh, Hybrid 7 comes with a new table space for table table. So, it's basically using a different table space and that gives an improvement result here. It's pushed in 5.7.2, it's about 11 times faster. So, uh, means we can uh, achieve this result for create and drop table, table table and if we are doing for insert, delete and update, that time it's Two to four times faster than five or six. So uh, while some DML uh, is executing, we know there was a bottleneck in five or six because uh, for every statement, for every execution, we need a lock, lock of a table, and that lock. Sometimes means when we are going for a metadata locking, so uh, there was a bottleneck. So uh, performance issue was there in five or six. Not a performance issue. There was a bottleneck. We know that uh, sometimes uh, it may be uh, it may be reduced the performance. So five or seven comes with a better way. Means uh, DML locking is improved in many different ways. We are going to explain all those things. How we improve the DML locking. So that's basically. Give us a 10% increased throughput for OLTP uh, read or a point select. All those things are done on a sysbench based uh, open source performance tool and for, uh, mostly 30 and uh, 48 port box. And we run those connections from 128 to 512 or more than that, maybe 1024 uh, concurrent connections with a standard uh, 50 uh, warehouse load. So uh, there are three, four ways. First is the implement of first part DML logs. So now when we are trying to execute our query, we need a DML log, means uh, a metadata log is required. So now the algorithm is, it will look for a first, uh, first part, means it won't be a static way, means if I execute the same query many times, the path won't be a same, like it, it needs say five or 10, uh, table level lock or row level lock. So every time that plan may change depending on the condition. So that's how it basically calculates the first pass path to uh, reach that lock. That's how it reduces the unnecessary locking, unnecessary holding. Then uh, lock free DML lock acquisition means uh, it's not a table level lock. It's become uh, it's now a mutex lock now. So how it will work? It's basically acquire the mutex lock, apply the change, apply the changes on the object, apply the changes on the object, and then release the mutex lock. So it's not asking the table level lock or database or row level lock. It's basically asking the mutex lock. And uh, we are coming with a new hash. This is the new hash technology. Uh, it basically when uh, non encrypted data is there, it, this has uh, works almost 30-40% higher, means it's not a benchmark is done uh, uh, on this has, but uh, this has is work on a key pair value and where the encryption is not done, so it works 30-40% higher in a higher rate. So we changes this log level so that the DML log 
get it much improved than the older one. Factor 7 replication. Uh, so better performance, improved usability, and enhance high availability. So how we achieve all those things? First is uh, higher throughput. So this is a MTS feature, multi thread dead slave. That's a 5.6 feature, but uh, 5.6 has an initial thing which where uh, multi thread slave means uh, slave can work on multi threaded way. But in 5.7, uh, that got improved. Uh, I, uh, in many ways, like um, uh, multiple thread work on a particular, on a single database, even on a single table also. I am going to explain this uh, how it works. Okay, and uh, change master without stopping the SQL thread. Like uh, you are replicating uh, two uh, two three uh, master in the same uh, slave. You you want to make a master uh, means a main slave kind of thing. Uh, where you want to replicate all the data. So uh, earlier, if you replicate slave uh, master one, then if you want to start replicating the uh, master two, you have to stop the slave, then change the master means point the slave to uh, uh, change the master of this slave to master two, and then start slave, and then slave will go. Now uh, we change that plan. Basically, how slave uh, works? One will be copied from the uh, I/O. And another will apply the those logs SQL basically. So uh, what basically what do we have to do? We have to stop the incoming data basically. But we can parallelly run the SQL apply thread. Means SQL can uh, still running. We don't have to stop whole slave. So you just stop the I/O thread and change the master. So you point to the new master and then start the slave. So it start copying from the new master, but same time parallelly your SQL thread is running. So it will start applying whatever you have in the window. Okay. Uh, so another thing is that lossless replication for the enhanced sensing. So in 5.7, we have many things done in the semi-sync replication. First thing is that it became uh, lossless how? One is that uh, earlier uh, semi -sync, in semi-sync replication, if uh, master having 10 slaves, master do the commit if it got acknowledgement from any of the slaves. Now we have a better way to configure it. Like we can say, okay, don't just consider one, you consider two, three, four, or what, what number we want to do. Like um, what that does mean, means uh, at least two or more than that, whatever we are giving the value in that uh, particular thing, that it will wait, okay, two slave done the copy, then I can do the comment. Earlier it was one. So now it's basically uh, very safe. Means if one slave also failed, you have a data. But performance? Yeah. So uh, we change that way also. Means how that will, means obviously this workload will impact the performance. But how we are going to reduce that means how we will improve the performance. One thing is that we make the acknowledgement thread and the relay thread are different. Like one thread will start sending the data to slave. Earlier, what happened? One thread is handling data and acknowledgement means it's sending and uh, accepting acknowledgement and data also. So that's become overloaded on uh, overloaded uh, thread. Now we make a different thread. One is will be sending the data, another will be just for the acknowledgement. It will send and accept the acknowledgement. So two thread is basically handling thing. This is the one way. And another way is that how it happened if masters uh, executing a statement, it's copied in the relay log, then it sends back to the slave. Slave do the copy. Slave send the uh, acknowledgement. Okay, I, I I got the uh, statement or I I have that data. Then it applied to the physical means it saved in the physical data, physical drive and do the commit. Now this, this there is a change. Before we uh, make changes in the physical uh, data, what we are doing as we already got the acknowledgement, do the commit and apply the uh, changes in physical data later. So if something happened means server got crashed, I know that slave already got the data. 
on a two slave model, three order data. So I don't, basically, we are uh, skipping this IO, IO uh, operation because that will be a cost layer operation, right? So we basically bypassing the IO operation. So I got the acknowledgement that, okay, this data is copied in the slave. <coughs> let's, uh, let's do the commit here and uh, apply this on the drive. That's how. It's basically crash safe because you know already two or more than that slave got the data. So if something happened to a master, something happened in one slave, there is another slave who have the updated data. Okay, I explained that semi-sync separate uh, acknowledgement collector. Uh, so uh, this uh, workload give a huge performance. Whatever till now we noticed, it's basically 10 to 20 times better performance for uh, 30, uh, 16, 32 higher version and in 8 core we noticed uh, okay this servicing uh, acknowledgement uh, separate acknowledgement collector will work <coughs> if you have a network delay between master and slave it will work there means you notice the huge difference uh, in performance improvement like if master and slave having one millisecond delay you don't feel that much difference but when your master and slave are uh, working remotely, means in a different location, there will be a say 50, 100 millisecond or more than that delay. You, you feel a very good result with this workload. It may be, means we have noticed if it's in 400, 300, 400 uh, network delay, it's coming almost 100% improvement. Uh, in partner schema, uh, I will explain it later. We have a separate uh, slide for uh, what new thing in Parkman schema for 5.7. Okay, um, 5.7 have a dynamic replication filter. Like you can uh, apply replication filter, uh, means change the replication filter dynamically. You don't have to stop or uh, those things. That's a new set of thing, means uh, do TB, means what TB you want to replicate, what you want to ignore, whatever filter, the replication hyphen those stuff. So multi-source replication, uh, it's under uh, laboratorymindschool.com. It's basically uh, you know, for a data variation solution kind of thing. Basically, till now, one slave can copy data from a single master at the same time. Means one slave will can copy data from a single master at the same time. So we overcome uh, this problem uh, with different kind of tools like uh, create some tools which will copy one second from one master then change the master uh, and point to the second master copy for certain time that's how but but the 5.7 is coming with a new way means you can uh, point a slave to multiple master when your data uh, basically the data is distributed on, on the uh, master like uh, your warehouse or OLTP is distributed geographically. You uh, in India, Europe, whatever. You are uh, you are uh, storing data of India in India server, in Europe, Europe data in Europe server. But basically, they are disjoint server, I mean, uh, disjoint data. Means India's customer data will be stored in India, Europe's customer data will be in Europe. So you know those are disjoint data. But when you are uh, you want to do some uh, data, means you want to apply some analytics want to do some business intelligence, some reporting, or you want to publish those data through queue, you have to aggregate those data, right? So uh, before this feature, you have to manually or you have to write some um, script to add to those data in a same <coughs> state or in a same location, then apply uh, whatever you want to do. But with this feature, with this multi-source replication, you can you can uh, configure your slave so that that can automatically copy this data from different master condition they are disjoint in nature means there are no conflict between data conflict between data if there is a conflict you have till now you have to uh, resolve it manually if the same data coming in two different server uh, duplication you have to resolve it manually basically otherwise it will copy means it will handle so you will get uh, finally a uh, aggregated data. So it will be easier for taking backup 
and applying those uh, business intelligence rules and provide the report. Okay, so basically it shows how this multi is like uh, giving the better and better performance. This is a till old uh, graph, I think 5.7.2, when uh, there are some major changes post. So I just explained two, three things, uh, like uh, how it works, means uh, multiple thread can work for single database. So transactions for a same database can be applied in the slave using two or more than uh, more uh, thread. So, and now not only that, if they are from the same database, uh, same table also, that can be handled. But provided the condition, they are somehow disjoint, disjoint in nature. Means they are applying changes on different rows or something. So uh, this was implemented in Fibre 7.2 uh, using a uh, concept called digital prop. Means these two transactions are separate means they are not asking log for same data set. If that's the case, then two thread can apply those changes in the slave simultaneously. There is a data from a user uh, how uh, we come up with a huge number of panic, uh, panic is panic thing. Means so last line this says 56k connect uh, connect per second. That's a huge. This is a workload asked by the Facebook, Twitter, uh, those huge giants that they need a huge number of connection disconnection at a uh, certain time per second. So till 5.6 it was a 25 to 27k. But in 5.6 uh, this graph shows basically. So it's uh, almost 35 because it's a uh, pretty old graph means uh, till 5.7.2 but in 5.7.3 and 4 we, uh, we have verified that this current discount is uh, 56k. So basically uh, what um, this graph shows is on with select and it's without select means connect, do some select, disconnect, basically point select kind of thing. It, this is just simple connect and disconnect means how frequently a connection, uh, disconnect can happen and this shows that uh, it's a 64% 64, 64 higher than the 5.6 older releases. So it's a uh, huge uh, thing. So what were the changes we had in 5.7 performance schema? So we have instrumentation for uh, memory, so added uh, for over 200 memory types. Like for every different operation, we have a different kind of memory handler. Okay, for uh, for event, for session, uh, for memory allocation, for index, means whatever operation is possible, they have a different type of memory allocation, different type of memory basically. So different type of memory, 200 memory types means for every different operation, we have a different memory allocation, deallocation rules. So we have come up with uh, 200 memory types. Means uh, you will get different uh, memory uh, information here, statistics basically. Means, uh, okay, this type of memory like trigger, how many types trigger asking for memory, allocation, deallocation, how how it used, what is the peak time, per session, per user. Means, okay, which all user ask? Uh, for more memory, what is the peak time means maximum memory used by that user or that by that session and what is the uh, lowest limit for that user or for that session. So all the kind of information now is available through the hardware schema. So thread per account per user per host memory information is available. Then memory queues means for a particular session, for a particular user, how much memory used already. 
operation counts. Operation counts means uh, a user asks for memory allocation or how many times memory deallocation, those kind of information. And high and low order mark. That means for a particular session, what is the highest amount of memory that user or that session asks? Uh, and then what is the lowest, no, lowest uh, range? This is basically called high and low order marks. So in fiber 7, we have some extra statement instrumentation like store procedure and store functions now can be monitored through this performance schema. Prepare statements, how it's working and if it's changed many times during the execution, you will get to know, okay, this time this is the plan, this time this is the plan, how it changed, what all information is required to monitor those things is now available. And for particular, okay, uh, before 5.7, we still 5.6, we have a highest level of instrumentation for the particular statement. Hence, uh, we can monitor a particular statement, like a select query, startup, and whatever. We can't go beyond that. <coughs> Means if a transaction having a multiple number of statement, we can't monitor a transaction at the same time. So we can maximum monitor a particular statement. Okay, this is the statement, what is the number of uses, uh, time, all those things. Now, in 5.7, we can monitor a particular transaction at a time. Means how this transaction is basically performing. If you have to monitor the transaction, you have to decide okay, it's a good transaction or it's blocking something. Whatever information you needed now is available. Same thing for uh, different events, also available. Not only transaction, events and other things also available. Additional data for replication monitoring, like uh, you can uh, monitor the replication slave status using the apartment schema and same way the MDL log means the metadata log instrumentation also available in apartment schema. Yeah. I think uh, you have to just um, enable those things in Parkland schema. How you enable for other things also. You have to enable those. Basically, you have to start instrumenting those things. Yeah, Mayan, do you want to add something? Yeah. Uh, so, from this one, collects data. specific to 507 but uh, I think it's a new thing uh, if you already not notice this that we are coming up with uh, different type of repository for uh, different distribution the distribution I have mentioned these things like uh, red Hat code Red. so we are supporting all those things and so 50% 50, 50 download uh, done So this is the next uh, next section of our presentation. Uh, what is our noise? Well, so 
So till now, whatever I have presented the new feature of MySQL, now we are going to explain some NoSQL support in MySQL. Before we start uh, how MySQL support NoSQL, I just uh, give you a quick overview of NoSQL. So NoSQL is a very high demand stuff on the web. So NoSQL means not that different from SQL, but it says not not only SQL. Means it may have SQL, but not only restricted to SQL. So how basically why we need a NoSQL? So uh, if you have to um, support uh, too many connections, high availability uh, for your server, so you have to basically scale 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 out of your server. There are different ways you can. Uh, increase the CPU, CPU uh, means the server load, all those things you can uh, do, uh, improve. But there are also a limit, means your SQL can't be extend too much that it, it can support uh, means a thousand times, uh, thousand query per second, not not like that for a, a huge number of nodes. That's why you need a NoSQL concept, means it won't follow the traditional relational database concept. So, your acid means it may not be a acid compliance, fully acid compliance. It may not uh, follow all the acid rules, but <coughs> but it have a different set of rules. So that calls a cap, basically availability, partition, and tolerance. So you have to choose a particular priority from these three. That what you want to do <coughs> means uh, consistency, availability, or partition tolerance. So you have to choose a particular way, and depending on that particular way, you have to build your uh, NoSQL concept. Means what is your demand? How you want to present? I mean, how you want to store? How you want to respond to your query? All those parameters uh, will uh, decide that what rule you want to follow. It doesn't mean that you will only consider one thing from the cap, means from the consistency, availability, and partition. But it can be changed dynamically. Means depending on the query, upcoming query, you can decide. Okay, now this is the workload, so let's make this is the priority. Let's make partition tolerance the priority or consistency is the priority. That's the rule basically. So uh, NoSQL taxonomy supports uh, key value stores, document type, big table, graph, and there are uh, many things. I will explain the key value stores because MySQL support key value stores only. How MySQL works? MySQL basically follow a memcached API to support the NoSQL. Uh, in the next slide, we are going to uh, describe how uh, this layer works, means why uh, NoSQL is much improved and how it's going to support NoSQL in MySQL. But in general, uh, in MySQL, so concurrent NoSQL and SQL access to the database. So that's the few good thing in uh, MySQL NoSQL. You can you can have a NoSQL and same time you have the support of SQL. So as we have a support of SQL, uh, it's basically for uh, in a InnoDB engine. So you can uh, guarantee that acid compliance will be there. And there is a auto sharding and online scaling. RDBMS means this area, how it works. Let's say MySQL server. So this is the client section. This will comes it uh, passes to the MySQL server, then handler array, then it goes to the InnoDB storage engine. Basically, uh, to optimize the query, the uh, time and execute that query, the, that basically takes the time. But if we bypass this portion in a different way. That will basically increase the performance. So, how uh, MySQL support that? It basically use the main uh, So we know the main API is basically a uh, in-memory uh, feature, in-memory uh, database basically. So it's basically kind of we can say kind of has where uh, uh, key value pair is stored. So you just say this is the key. It will give the help. So basically, uh, works that way. So main cache plugin, 
then it basically entirely bypass all those layers, SQL Server layers. So it's basically uh, using this plugin and uh, pass into InnoDB API and directly store or retrieve data in the InnoDB storage engine if required. Otherwise, obviously, it will use the in memory stuff. So that's what it's basically uh, that. Uh, so uh, we can use MKSD, there are other native programs also. Um, so we, we need a application kind of thing. I, in the next slide, we will go through some uh, code. It's basically for example, it's not a working code. It will give an idea how you can implement that thing. So uh, let's say we are using a Java or JavaScript, uh, and we are including the MKSD API. Uh, we are using or importing that API, and then we are implementing layer and we can directly access on this page. Before we go to uh, how it works basically, it's just few points uh, for the performance gain. And then, uh, I'll explain the chart later, but I just have a look. Basically, uh, it's a 9x10. And there is a huge number gain in fiber seven. We reach one million QPS or TPS. I say uh, rather it's a QPS per second using no SQL support. I'm not explaining one, uh, too many things here because uh, anyway we need to explain in the class. It's basically generally how MemCast API works. Let's say. Uh, I want to execute this select start from user when user ID is provided. So then in a traditional RTP MS, if uh, this is the function get get function, then it will execute this data is equal to select this and then return the data. So if we want to alternative way, meaning memplasty, how it works, it basically a uh, hash function kind of thing. Where I I have a um, data in my in memory, already in, in memory. So it basically say data is equal to fetch basically to a fetch. Then if that fetch failed, means data is not in the memory, that time you have to execute the uh, same thing. So this failure, chances of failure is less because we have a uh, set, uh, set of numbers, a set of boxes uh, which, uh, with the in memory where almost the, uh, all the database is stored. So that will be very fast. That's how it's improved the result. So, but if any case it's a miss, then it will execute this and store, uh, add this uh, set of data in the memory and it return the result. So, memcast basically works on three basic functions, get, set, put. So, get means retrieve the data from the memory and set means basically <coughs> update kind of thing. Like, uh, if that uh, key value already exists, it will update, but if key value is not present, it's a new set of data, it basically insert. And put means it basically do a insert, simple insert. And if that uh, it's uh, already the uh, key value is present, it do nothing. We don't update basically. This is the three major function for main question. Okay, how oh, you can configure uh, no square in my square. I, this is very uh, basic thing, means uh, it's uh, just an example. You can't copy this code and you, can, you can't expect this will work. But it's just give you an idea that how you have to do this. So uh, you can load that plugin. At, uh, you can add this in the, your myconfig, like plugin load is equal to uh, 11 my uh, this socket, or you can load this on runtime. Like, install plugin, this. Then, there would be a mapping between your actual DB and the memcached DB. Because you don't want to store full data uh, in the memory or your memory may hold some other information for uh, the help of the uh, key value pair, but you don't want to store those data in the actual physical database. So you have to create those uh, mapping how you want to retrieve those data. Like you have to def uh, uh, you have to define the key and value pair set first. 
So you can write it in a SQL file. So here I have mentioned that this is the source. So either you have to create, you have to create first, then you can source it, or you can uh, define here also. Like you can de define here also. You just simply define an ID and name this format. Okay. So like you would create a database, create a table inside that, and create a mapping between your uh, main case database and the actual InnoDB database, actual InnoDB engine. Okay. So it basically works on Telnet. I am not explaining all those things. So after you define everything, you can uh, use Telnet to insert data, to delete data, how you, you want. So it's basically you are doing a Telnet and then say here is the, this is the key value. So, That's how you can store. <coughs> uh, I think it's not easy. You can understand? No. It's a basically a Java code where I have used this MKSD API. Okay. Then board. I import the MKSD API for Java. And define a object. And then I have used I have made different forms to store, uh, retrieve those data, delete those data. How much performance gain we have done in 5.6? So you can uh, see basically it's a cell is monitoring using the noise scale. It's basically using noise scale. And uh, so this section is basically RTP noise or uh, MySQL and this is a MySQL when using the main cache API. Basically, no SQL in MySQL. Now, I'll show some graphs 5.6 versus 5.7. So, you can notice a huge difference. Huge difference. So, we have touched 1 million QPS in 5.7. This test on down on uh, 48 core, 32 to 48 core box with a, yeah. Sorry? Ah, read only. Read only. I mentioned it. Read only. So read only means it's kind of point select. Yeah. So DM will reach per second. Uh, you can see uh, these are the peaks. So for 48 4, you can achieve these things. Right. This means uh, we need insert. We have present all those things. It's basically you can see it only the event rates. And how CPU utilized. So the rate graph shows utilization of CPU and this is the uh, CPU not in place. So we have noticed if we have uh, for 48 core, we make uh, we change uh, we do a optimize uh, in noise field, that time we get a better performance, means it's one million. 1 million QPS. Okay. Few references to get more data from here. So all the um, performance related data I have shown here is in this block. And uh, for 5 uh, new feature <coughs> you can develop this. And overall you okay. Thank you everyone. I'm going to start off with explaining the typical use case that inspired sharding in fabric. And then I'm going to move on to fabric architecture itself. I'm going to be going very quick through the main use case because I want to reach the fabric slide soon. So please bear with me. So we're going to see what is this sharding, what are the benefits of sharding, and how do I shard my database. Uh, any typical startup, you take any typical enterprise, what they do is they start with a prototype. So most of them start with either the prototype model or the iterating model. So your product manager tells you, look, 
I want to develop this application. You immediately go back to your desktop, start a MySQL server, start writing your application, and quickly in about a week or two, you develop an application that you can show as proof of concept to your manager. So basically, it starts off with a single database server. Now, if your code works, it's going to take more hits. So you probably move it to a development environment where your application is going to take more customers, more hits. So your code works even more, your traffic is going to get, your traffic is going to increase. So what happens is you have a single database server that is being hit by um, a both read. Uh, so you, what you have, what you have is one database that is being hit continuously by both read and write queries. So you decide that your database is overloaded. You look for an immediate solution. You decide that you want to scale out your reads. So you replicate your database. You basically create a read-write separation. Your slaves or your read-only servers handle your reads. There's one master that handles your writes. So now you have an application that is working fine. You manage to scale your reads. Uh, you, are, you, you have done nothing about the writes. And you suddenly find out that your write load has increased. So, indicate. So, your server is um, say your server is basically hit by a uh, large write load, but you manage to scale your reads. So now, what do you do? Uh, you think for a while. You decide. Okay, I just have one master. Why don't I use two masters? But does not work because what happens is when you have writes, you need to replicate your writes across both the masters. So both the masters need to write the data. Although you can read the data from just one of the servers. So trying to use just one master is not going to work for you here. So what you decide to do is you actually decide to split your data. And this is where sharding comes into focus. So what exactly is sharding? What exactly do you do when you shard? A typical use case will be, let us say, um, uh, let us use a number for which I know uh, the number of zeros. For example, I know that 40,000 has four zeros. Yeah, so 40,000 has four zeros. So I find that uh, I have 40,000 records on one server. I find that the traffic for the 40,000 records is huge. There are, the, there are more records being inserted. I really don't know what to do. So I decide, okay, let me split the records into 20,000 records in one server, 20,000 records in the other server. So you are actually based, uh, you are creating a physical separation of the data within the database itself. So what are the benefits you get when you decide to split the data itself? You get write scalability because the writes for the subset of uh, UIDs on the first server does not go to the second server and vice versa. Uh, your large data set is reduced. So what happens is um, you initially end up with a large data set that is too large and does not fit on a single server. So now that you have sharded, the data set reduces and it starts to fit into a single server because you created a physical separation for the data itself. You get improved performance because you have smaller, in, uh, you have smaller amount of data and smaller index sizes. You have a smaller working set and naturally improves performance. So once you decide that sharding is required in your uh, in your end application. You need to decide what are the components that you need to implement the sharding solution itself for your use case, and you need to decide how are you going to deploy your sharded servers and the other components that are required. So, uh, what I what I am trying to describe here is a very high level view of what are the components that you need when you decide to. Uh, when you decide that your data really needs to be sharded. So the bunch of computers that you see here are the clients that are actually trying to fire a query. So this is a switch that actually tries to redirect, redirect the query to the correct shard or to the correct separation of data. So this is the state store that actually has the metadata about which of the shards contain which range of the data. 
And the executor is the component that manages the shard itself. When we go to the fabric architecture, we will understand why we need an executor. I mean, the architecture itself seems very simple and uh, simple and intuitive. I mean, this is what you need. I mean, you need the connectors going to a switch, asking where I need to go. The switch tells you where you need to go, and you go to the shard. I mean, why do you need an executor? Uh, why do you need? I mean, why do you? What is the point of having an executor here at all? I mean, it'll be evident as we move forward in the slides. So. As I explain the fabric architecture, I also will be handling uh, how transactions and shard keys are managed in fabric. So how are the transactions handled? Uh, how do you get the shard key for a particular transaction that is being fired? And how do you compute the shard? I mean, so once you are given a shard key, how will you compute the shard itself? So there are various schemes for doing it. There are, there are, there's a range-based architecture, there's a hash-based architecture. Let us look at all that. So this is how your typical transaction looks. It's a small example. So you have a begin, you have a comment. Uh, so when you begin, you need to mention where this transaction needs to be executed. So before you before you begin your transaction, you are going to mention the sharding key so that the sharding key can be mapped to a particular shard. Where do you store the session state? I mean, so each transaction is going to have a session state. How is the session state going to be managed? In fabric, this is not a problem. I will explain why. Uh, how do you handle read-only transactions? How do you handle write transactions? What do you do after the transaction is done? Do you clear the session state? Now there's a new transaction. So what should I do now? I mean, do I do I switch to a new shard, or what do I do about the session state then? So transaction handling, handling in fabric uh, typically involves detecting the transaction boundaries, managing the session state, uh, resetting the state after each transaction. So same thing that I explained in the query in the previous slide. So what exactly is a sharding key? I mean, so when I say I'm going to map the shard key to a shard, what exactly is a sharding key? And how do I map the shard key to a shard? Key? So sharding key is going to be a column in the table that is being sharded. So take an employee table for example. An employee table has employee number. Uh, so intuitive choice for employee table would be the employee number as the sharding key. So you look at the employee number, you decide this set of employees is going to this shard, this set of employees is going to this shard and so on. Now could the sharding key be a single column? Could the sharding key be multiple columns? Yeah, there are use cases where sharding keys can be multiple columns too. We uh, we had a customer who wanted uh, who wanted multiple columns as sharding key. And uh, how is the key transformed? So how is the sharding key itself transformed into a shard location? So I have a MySQL server running. I have a sharding key. Now how am I going to map this sharding key to this particular MySQL server? So. So what is a sharding key? So it can be a single column, it can be multiple columns. So how is the sharding key itself transformed? So a simple scheme, so if you are going to decide that, I mean what is there in deciding a shard key distribution mechanism, I mean, so you decide that the first thousand are going into one shard, the next thousand are going into other shard, now the problem is going to be that your last shard or the last range of values is always going to be loaded. You decide on such a scheme. Such schemes are available. There are specific use cases to use such schemes. But if you decide to go with the scheme, please understand that your last shard will always be loaded and you will end up splitting the last shard all the time. So you want to create a uniform distribution, you can use hash-based sharding. You want to create your own distribution, you can use range-based sharding. And going forward, timeline not specified. And the safe harbor statement included, we will be adding uh, user defined sharding schemes also. So what happens basically is, uh, you basically compute the shard from a sharding key. Uh, I deliberately did not include a slide that translates a given sharding key using a hash based scheme into a, a shard location. Uh, it was, I mean I already had a lot of slides and it was just increasing the number of slides. So. Uh, but what I can tell you about uh, the computation function is, you, it could be any simple function. For example, let us take a simple case of range-based sharding, like I, uh, uh, like I explained, the employee number. So you decide that a range of employee numbers is going to one shard, another range is going to another shard. The compute, for, the compute, the compute shard function 
All it does is it gets the key which is going to be employee ID. It finds out which range the key falls into. It already has metadata that says that this range belongs in this shard, this range belongs in the other shard and so on. So it's just going to go to that shard, that's it. So it's just a direct mapping function. Uh, the hash page schemes in Fabric internally uses MD5. It uses um, it uses the crypto uh, the cryptographic graph, uh, the cryptographic hash MD5 for uh, uh, uniform distribution of the shard key values. But I'm not going to be discussing in these slides. And if you have a specific query, we will have to take it offline. So what exactly is the granularity of sharding? What do we shard? I mean, do we shard a database? Do we shard a table? Uh, what are global tables? What are cross database queries? I mean, so let's look at all of this. So this is your typical example of uh, a sharded table. Uh, yeah, you guys are not able to see the tables, right? You're not able to see? OK, I'll call it out for you. So let's start with the most interesting table among the sharded tables, the salaries table. <laughs> Very interesting table. I mean, so uh, the salary table is also indexed by the employee number. Then you have the title table that tells you whether uh, you are a senior developer, you are a junior developer. It's again indexed by employee number. Then you have the employee table itself indexed by the employee ID. You have the department table that indicates which department the employee belongs to indexed by the employee number again. You have the department manager, the dude who manages you, who is indexed by the employee number again. I mean. He's not indexed exactly, he's going to have his own number, but the thing is, uh, it's, it's going to form a foreign key here. So, uh, this table is going to tell you which manager manages which list of employees, and then you have the departments themselves. So, if you notice this set of tables, the salaries table, the titles table, the employee table, the department, the department tables are all connected to, uh, together by a common sharding key, the employee number. But you see that the department table does not have the employee number. So, I mean, uh, you are listing all the departments that are available, right? I mean, why do you index it using an employee number? So, this is what I call a global table, and I will, I will explain why we call it a global table. A sample set of rows are here. I mean, I really don't know how to read this. What's this? Units, tens, hundreds, doesn't matter. So, it's a big number. So, basically, these are tables that qualify for sharding. Because you can't, you don't want to store all of them in a single chart. I mean, uh, I mean, you can ideally store all of them in a single chart. MySQL can manage much more than the numbers quoted here, but seems like a nice example. So um, these numbers are big, and you want to shard these numbers. But these two are small. You don't want to shard them because even if they are there in every database, you it's there in every chart. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to occupy much space. So I'm going to call these global tables and I'm going to explain later why they are called global tables. Okay. So let us say that we are firing a query with sharded tables. So the tables that we are using is uh, salaries and employees. Interesting query, isn't it? How I wish I were able to fire it. So you have the salary table here and you have the employee table here and you're going to fire a join between these two based on the employee numbers. Now assume that this schema is sharded. So this schema is sharded on employee number. What do I mean when I say the schema is sharded? So each of your shard is going to have all these tables. So each of your shard will have the same schema. Each of the shard will have the same uh, ER diagram replicated. Or so, um, so your, each of this schema is going to have the salary, titles, employees, and the tables. But the subset of the data will depend on the employee number that is being used as the sharding key. Now, you are firing a join. So, you are going to fire a join on a particular shard that involves two sharded tables, the salary table and the employees table. So, when you fire a join that involves only this shard, or when it involves only one shard, it's not a problem. I mean, you, you are firing a query, all the tables are there, your join is going to succeed. Now what happens when you are trying to fire cross shard joins? I mean, you, you want to access the uh, employee table from one shard, you want to access the employee table or uh, the salary table from the other shard. Uh, well, in this sharding scheme, it is very difficult to build a use case where you want to access cross shard tables. 
But for now, in fabric, support for firing uh, uh, cross shot joints is in the pipeline. We, we are thinking about it. It will be there sometime in the future. There will be something to do with sometime in the future. But for now, we have only joints between sharded tables on the same shot. You can fire joints between sharded tables on the same shot and you will get results. But what do you do? Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I spent quite an effort explaining to you why these tables need to be sharded and, and telling you why the joints between the sharded tables succeed. I mean, but still you want to do sharding between, you want to do fire a joint between uh, tables across the shots. What can you do? What is the facility we provide? What we do is, we identify tables that need not be sharded. For example, the department table is small. It need not be sharded. And you are going to keep firing joints on the department table. You know that you are going to keep firing joints on the department table and every shard. You, and the department table, I mean, an employee can be in any department, right? You are sharding according to the employee number. From employee number 1 to employee number 100, you can have employees in any department. So, in that case, if, if I am sharding by employee number, I cannot shard my department tables also. Because, what would happen in that case is, I would have only part of the department table in one shard. I fire a join, it's going to fail saying that the department is not found. So, what we do is we make the department table as global. So, the, the department table will be replicated across all the shards. The data of the department table will be present in all the shards. And the fabric framework will automatically take care of updating the department table across all the shards. So when we look at the sharding architecture, I'll explain how the sharding architecture actually facilitates the department table to be updated across all the shards. Yeah. So, so you have a global table. So you decide to join uh, the employee's table with the department employee's table and the department's table. So now you see that the joints with the doc, uh, department's table are going to occur very often. Well, make it a global table, it will be available across all the shards, you can fire the joints. So how do we update the global tables? Again, as we look at the fabric schema, it, uh, things will be evident. So, now I actually come to the MySQL fabric presentation. Uh, MySQL fabric is basically a framework for managing a farm of MySQL servers and it has support for high availability as well as sharding. So it's very important to remember that when you shard, you talk about distributing the data across MySQL servers. But what about the availability in the shard itself? So what, what happens if the server in the shard goes down? I mean, do you lose all the data in the shard? No, because we support sharding over high availability. So it's a framework that supports high availability as well as sharding. So let's look at the architecture. So this is the basic fabric architecture. So what, uh, uh, let us look at the components one by one. And then I will explain how these components work together. So you have the connectors, you have your application. Your application uses the connectors, any of the connectors, the Java connector, the C connector, the PHP connector, to talk to, uh, to, talk to the MySQL server. You have your fabric node here. Uh, you have, uh, so, this is a magnification of uh, the what happens inside uh, so inside the MySQL servers. So I didn't want to take up uh, the terminology of groups, but then let's just uh, so the, each of this is a fabric group. So what is a fabric group? A group is a logical concept in fabric. I mean, a group is a terminology introduced by fabric itself. So we say a group is a group of MySQL servers. It's just intuitive. So. What does a group have? It, a group has MySQL servers arranged in a high availability configuration. So the high availability configuration could be anything. You could have master master, you could have master slave, you could have semi-synchronous, you could have asynchronous, you could have the cluster. So you could have, uh, you could have any third party tool providing you high availability in the groups. Fabric is just okay with any high availability configuration with each of these groups. But for now, we have support for, uh, we know that it works out of box for asynchronous and semi-synchronous. Uh, we, we have also tried uh, having a cluster here, but then you have to understand that if you are going to deploy a cluster, you have to, uh, I mean, you are going to work some magic yourself. I mean, so you want a fully automated support from Fabric, you could use, uh, uh, 
asynchronous application which we have tested completely you could also use semi-synchronous application for which you will get more, I mean most of the things will be supported it should work out of the box so what happens basically when your application is running so if you notice the components that actually change are the MySQL components your connector changes to become fabric aware your fabric node has been introduced your MySQL servers are increased the, the application itself is going to take change to the extent that it is going to start using the new my, uh, the connector code. So we have uh, we have changed the connectors to the extent that they have become fabric aware. What do you mean by fabric aware? When you fire a typical query, for example, let us take this table. So you want to access employee number thousand. So you are firing a typical query. Where the employee number is say 1000. So your application, your application basically tells the connectors, look, I want to contact the shard where uh, I, I want to contact the shard that contains employee number 1000. So the connector internally will automatically contact the fabric node. It will take it will take, so if it is the first time that the connectors are contacting fabric, it will take a dump of the metadata from fabric and then it will use the metadata dump that is present in the connectors to go to the correct MySQL servers. So the cache in the connectors is configurable. So you can configure the TTL in the connectors. So going forward we will have a more consistent distributed management mechanism for this. But for now we just use the cache TTL. So you can configure the TTL here so that you can avoid this extra hop. So you don't need to go to the MySQL fabric node every time because the metadata dump is already taken. So MySQL fabric looks into its metadata. Uh, it queries where exactly the employee number 1000 is located and based on the information it gets, it goes to the appropriate MySQL servers. So this is the basic architecture. Like I said, each of this is high availability groups. Your, the concept of a shard exists over the high availability groups. You have the MySQL fabric node that is an extra component that is added. You need to upgrade to the new MySQL connectors that have become fabric aware. So we need to look into what exactly is inside a fabric node itself. What are the components inside a fabric node that's available? So right now the only way to contact a fabric node that has been written is through XML RPC. So you fire XML RPC query to the fabric node for getting the metadata. <coughs> Uh, there is ongoing work to support the MySQL protocol itself to contact Fabric, which would mean you could use a MySQL client to actually ping Fabric and get the information, or use asynchronous message processing queue. I mean, so uh, these two are, um, I mean, we are working on these two, and this is a priority, the MySQL protocol itself. Uh, the extensions to the Fabric framework right now are in the form of high availability and in the form of sharding. You can have any extensions you want. If you decide that you want to manage the servers in a particular way, you want to use MySQL Fabric's metadata but want to add support in MySQL Fabric to manage the servers in a particular way, you can add extensions. Uh, you have uh, the executor. So what the executor does is it tracks the fabric operations itself. So let us say you are performing a shard operation. You add a shard, you split a shard, you move a shard, or you are doing a high availability operation. You have done a promote or you have done a demote. Now when you fire, uh, when you fire a, uh, a fabric query or a fabric operation and let us say there is a crash in the middle of this fabric operation. So you are doing a move and there is a crash. How will you, re so next time you restart the fabric node, fabric needs to know that you left the move in the middle. So it needs to restart from the middle of the move. So that's what the executor takes care of. So the executor actually has mechanism to track the current, uh, the operations that are ongoing in fabric log them using write ahead logging and use them for recovery if the fabric node clashes. The executor is also responsible for sequencing the operations that take place in fabric. So uh, if when there are multiple fabric operations that are fired, you don't need to do each of them one by one. So the read only operations where you are just trying to read the metadata, they can happen in parallel with the operations that are trying to write the metadata. So these can go in parallel. So the executor takes care of sequencing them. Then you have the state store that stores the information inside fabric into a MySQL node. 
So these are the basic components of uh, the MySQL fabric framework. Yeah. So let's move on. What is the architecture for high availability? The architecture for high availability is the concept of groups in fabric. So each group is a group of servers. Uh, you, you have you have both data redundancy as well as hardware redundancy because you have multiple MySQL servers running inside a group. You can choose to have all the MySQL servers running inside one box or you could have one box for each MySQL server that is replicating to other MySQL servers. The group is a generic concept. It is not a... It's just a terminology. Uh, we are not saying that a group should be a set of asynchronous servers or it should be a set of synchronous uh, MySQL servers. You could use anything inside a group. You could have a cluster, you could have semi-synchronous replication, you could have asynchronous replication. Ideally speaking, you can even run uh, other not so efficient solutions for providing high availability of cluster like maybe, let me see, Galera? <laughs> I don't know. So, I mean, you can use it at your own risk, but yes, you can go ahead and use it. Uh, you can use, like I said, you can use different types. You could have primary data, a master slave, you could have shared or replicated storage, or you can run MySQL cluster. So, we've already seen this. Uh, a group is an abstract concept. Uh, what are the attributes that you can configure in a group? You can mark some of the servers as read only, you can mark some of them as read write, so that uh, the group, uh, so that MySQL, so the connectors automatically distribute your query. So, you mark a query as read only, it will go to the slaves. You mark a query as read write, it will automatically go to the master. Wait. So you mark you, you you know that some of the servers in a group can handle more load. Some of them can handle less load. You you give the servers that have more load that can handle more load more weight. Most of the traffic will go there. So the connectors will ensure it for you using the metadata from Fabric. The status uh, this is basically an internal thing. It basically tracks the status or the role of a particular server at any time. It could be primary, it could be secondary, it could be spare, and so on. Architecture for sharding, once you understand groups, understanding sharding is not much, except that you have a global group. So the global group, all the servers basically replicate from the global group. So you have an operation that needs to update a global group across all the shards. You mark the query as global. The connectors will automatically redirect the query to the global group and the query will replicate across all the shards. The connectors take care of it for you. You just have to mark the query as global. That is it. And otherwise, the, it's the same. I mean, the shards operate over a MySQL group. Uh, the group provides high availability. The shards provide uh, horizontal scalability. The architecture works great. And now, please, I should thank you, Sai. Oh, man. <laughs> it's like magic. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for bearing with me, guys. Uh, I haven't written my email ID here. So I haven't written my email ID here. So my email ID is b.narayanan at oracle.com. If you have any questions, feel free to ping me anytime. I read the email, I'll respond. <laughs>